Welcome back to the Dry Fasting Club. Today we're going to be talking about the science behind how a one-day dry fast is equivalent to a three-day water fast in raw autophagy power. So if you've been dry fasting for a while, you've probably thrown around this saying, this statistic. And to be honest, you've probably been laughed at by 99.9% .9 of the rest of the population or anyone that was reading. I'm like, okay, crazy dry fasting man, you keep uh, doing and throwing around those numbers. But today we're actually going to use a fantastic paper called The Selfish Brain is Regulated by Aquaporins and Autophagy Under Nutrient Deprivation. So this paper is great because it almost looks like by accident they tested for dry fasting scenarios. Kudos to the researchers because they went above and beyond and they created a control group, a water fasted group, a group that only ate food with no water, and then they went as far as doing a full water and food deprivation group. Because of this, and because they tracked autophagy levels, we're able to see what actually happens on a dry fast in the brain. This specific topic in this paper can be used by all you dry fasters who have just been waiting for the moment to be like, hey, gotcha. But let's not get carried away. Uh, to start off, what is autophagy? Most of you guys have heard it, and this term gets thrown around everywhere online. But people think it's something extremely complicated to understand. But autophagy is basically just the recycling system of the body. And we've got so many different types of autophagies. We've got microautophagy, macro, chaperone-mediated, which is a fairly recent one, and it shares a lot of similarities with heat shock proteins. There's also autophagy of the mitochondria, peroxisomes, and so much more. And here's one for you that you're going to be hearing about a lot more over the coming years. Hypertonic stress-induced autophagy. And that's basically dehydration autophagy. But anyways, let's go back to how we actually measure autophagy. So the one of the simplest ways to do it is to look at the LC3 protein levels. And I'll just scroll down here. So LC3 proteins have two phases. And you can see here that the first phase, phase one, floats around in the cell. And when autophagy occurs, it needs to be converted to its phase two. And that's the one that it actually attaches to the membrane of autophagosomes. And then, then the autophagosomes are, actually we can show it over here, the autophagosome actually gets formed after the LC3 second phase appears and binds to it. And then autophagosomes hold all the things that want to be degraded. And then they fuse with lysosomes. Lysosomes are basically these acid particles floating around, these molecules that have the power to actually degrade what's inside the autophagosome. So when they merge together, it's called an autophagolysosome. And that's how autophagy basically works. So it starts to make sense that if you're seeing high levels of LC3 in that second phase, we know that autophagy is occurring. And if you're inducing certain different scenarios or stresses and then measuring those LC3 levels, you can see which one is producing how much autophagy. In this study, they looked at aquaporin levels, which are proteins that allow water to cross cellular membranes. So that's pretty cool for dry fasting. But the coolest thing is that they looked at the LC3 levels. And here we were able to see, and I can pull it up over here. What we see is that the LC3 levels spike drastically on a dry fast and then slowly go down. And the water fast over here, you can see how gradually it goes up. And by the third day, it actually spikes. And it only really goes up to about just over the 2.0 mark while on the dry fast, it almost hits the 3.0 mark. And then when we compare it to a the control group, so we actually see that autophagy occurs on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, some caveats for people that are really sick, maybe have autoimmune diseases, and those may impact your autophagic pathways uh, and your auto basic autophagy. But looking at the control group and we see that it's at about 1.5. So a water fast on the first two days is barely significant. It's actually crazy. Yes, it's a little bit more significant than if you were to not drink water but keep eating food, and that's a topic for another discussion. But going back into these levels, 
if we actually calculate how much additional autophagy is happening on the day one of the dry fast, we go from 1.5 to 3. So we're basically dealing with an additional 1.5. So something like a 200% increase in autophagy. On day one, two, and three of the water fast taken together, you are barely scratching that 200%. So we can conclude that there is actually more autophagy happening on day one of a dry fast than three days combined of a water fast. And that is wild. But what is actually crazy if we forget about the dry fasting group for a second, we look at the no food versus no water. And we see that on day three, the autophagy levels are very similar. And if we consider the first two days of a water fast to be nearly insignificant in terms of autophagy, it shows us that maybe a dehydrated state is one of the strongest precursors to actual autophagy. And maybe the deeper we go into a water fast, you know how we dump electrolytes? And I'm not getting into the topic of electrolyte loading, snake juices, and all of that, but the body actually drops water deeper on a water fast. And what if that drop and osmolite increase is actually what drives autophagy to these higher levels? This is a crazy rabbit hole to go down. So what does this all mean? Yes, now we see how powerful a dry fast actually is. And just a 24 hour looks like it already does so much for you. And that's why it plays into that idea of a 36 hour dry fast as kind of like a maintenance fast, maybe weekly, maybe bi-weekly, maybe even monthly. But you get to choose if you're in the search of autophagy, if you either want to do a 36 hour dry fast or an 84 hour water fast. Between you and I, I know what I'm choosing. I prefer to be a little more efficient. And, well, you know what this channel focuses on. But I think it's a no-brainer. So what are you going to do with this information? Hopefully, you can use it to adapt to your healing protocols and your plans. And you can also use it as a tool to show others that dry fasting is not crazy. And there are proven insane benefits to doing it. Obviously, you should fast responsibly, and everybody is different. Some people might benefit more from doing a water fast versus a dry. You have to do a lot of research. You definitely should talk to your medical professionals, and, and maybe you can show them these studies or talk to them about this a little bit more and see if they're on board with helping you design a plan for yourself. All in all, that's it for this one. Hopefully, you learned something, and as always, good luck on your healing journey. Thanks for sticking around. If you liked the video, leave a comment and share your ideas. And if you're looking for very detailed and unique protocols, check out the dryfastingclub.com. You'll find a lot there. You can even book a quick chat with me. There's also a free Discord link that you can find on the site. And I highly recommend you check out the forums and share your insights and experiences about dry fasting. Uh, you can kind of treat it like accountability, but really, you can help a lot of other people. And as always, remember, no two people are the same, so every fasting experience is unique. Good luck on your dry fasting journey.